بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن ولاه ما بعد This is our 13th lesson going through the book مختصر في شجاع في الفقه على مذهب الإمام الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى أوثر بها القاضي أبو حسين أحمد أبو الحسين أحمد بن الحسين ابن أحمد الأصفهاني رحمه الله تعالى الحمد لله ويصدر لنا كتاب الصلاة أو يهذا رعب يتفصل السهو في الصلاة يوثر رحمه الله سر والمتروك من الصلاة ثلاثة أشياء فرض وسنة وهيئة فالفرض لا ينوب عنه سجد السهو بل إن ذكره والزمان قريب أتى به وبنى عليه وساجد للسهو والسنة لا يعود إليها بعد تلبس بالفرض لكنه يسجد للسهو والهيئة لا يعود إليها بعد تركها ولا يسجد للسهو عنها وإذا شك في عدد ما أتى به من الركعات بنى على اليقين وهو الأقل وساجد للسهو وسجود السهو سنة ومحدره قبل السنة And so here this chapter the author is discussing the مسائل pertaining to prostration due to forgetfulness And prostration due to forgetfulness is essentially legislated in one of four cases The first case is if a person does something that if you were to do it on purpose it would notify his prayer So if someone does something and if he was to do that thing on purpose then it would notify his prayer and so basically he did it out of forgetfulness but if he was to do it on purpose it would notify his entire prayer coming with that type of action due to forgetfulness uh, requires from you to do the sahwa of course ala as sunnah this requirement is of course what I mean by it is sunnah it is sunnah as the author rahim wa ta'ala mentioned wa sujudu sahwi sunnatun the prostration due to forgetfulness is a sunnah so if someone misses it out then it doesn't notify their prayer that's the first point which is that if a person does something that were it to be done on purpose it will notify the prayer that's something which you have done you should come with sujud sahwa and of course, when do you do sujud sahu? You do it before the salam. So when you finish the tashahud al-akhir and then the salat al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then whatever du'a you want to make, you then come with sujud sahu and then you finish the salah with the tasbih. طيب. The second case is a person who transfers a rukun qawli from one place to another. So if you transfer a rukun qawli, a statement rukun, a statement-based rukun, a statement-based pillar from one place to another, of course, out of forgetfulness, then you should come with sujood al-sahu for example somebody does the fatiha during the tahiyyat someone does the fatiha during the recitation of the tashahud or someone does the tashahud during the recitation of the, of the fatiha he's put a rukun qawli in a place that it does not belong in and he did this out of forgetfulness then this person should come with sujood al-sahu the third case is if someone leaves off a pillar out of forgetfulness then of course it is obligatory for him to return to that pillar because as we know the salad it is built up of these pillars. If there is a pillar missing, then the salah is incomplete. طيب. And so if someone leaves for a pillar forget, out of forgetfulness and he returns to it, طيب. of course he must return to it, but if he does return to it, then you should come with sujood sahu in order to cover up that error, that mistake. Or let's say somebody added on to the salah. Method and he prayed five instead of four, for example. Or he prayed, or he was doubtful as to whether he prayed three or four, and so he built off that which is less, as is, of course, the author Rahim Allah mentioning. وإذا شك في عدد ما أتى به من الركعات بنى على اليقين هو الأقل وساجد للسهو that if a person doubts as to whether he has يعني doubts in regards to the number of units that he's prayed whether it's three or four he built off that which is less which is three because that's what he is certain of he's done at least three but he's unsure whether he's done three or four so he built off that which you are sure of which is three اليقين لا يزول بالشك right and then you come up with سجد السهو to cover up that that doubt which you have had so that's the third case طيب uh Something that falls under the third case is someone who leaves off a pillar, someone who left a pillar. As I said, he must recover it. For example, someone left off the rukur, and he went into sujood straight away. So he was doing the qiyam, and then instead of coming with the rukur, which is the next rukun, he went straight into the sujood. So he missed off the rukur, the tumanina in the rukur. Likewise, al-rafu al-atidal, wa tumanina tu fi, and also the naam al-rafu wa tumanina tu fi, right? Because he went into the sujood. So he missed off four pillars, right? So this person, he is left off these four pillars. It is obligatory for him to return back to the first pillar which he forgot, which is the rukur, right? And then he does the rukur, and then he carries on from the rukur, meaning he comes with the tumanina, and then he rises up from the rukur, does tumanina, and then goes into the sujood. And what he did in the sujood that he did initially, when he when he made that mistake, that's not counted. That is not counted. And so he comes back up, does the rukur. And then uh, continues from the rukur, and then he, when he finishes the prayer, or when he comes towards the end of the prayer before the salam, he makes the sujood sahu to cover up for that mistake. طيب. What if now somebody did a uh, a rukur, 
somebody did a a ruku and uh, uh, or let's say somebody forgot to do the ruku so let's say uh, same examples we done previously we have a person is praying salat and he's in the first rak'ah he recited the fatiha and he went straight into the sujood so he forgot the ruku and that which comes after it between the ruku and the sujood and then he continued with the salah so he did the sujood and he came back up again for the second rak'ah and then he went into the ruku for the second rak'ah and then when he was in that ruku position he realized wow i forgot the ruku for the first rak'ah what does he do does he go back to the first rak'ah and then uh, repeat the process again لا. Rather, what he does is he treats this ruku' that he's in now as the first ruku'. So he treats the ruku' he's in right now as the first ruku', meaning everything he just done previously, it's put aside. It's not counted. It does not count. Meaning the ruku' he's doing now is the first ruku'. Meaning when he gets up again, it will be the first Allah bin Hamidah, the first rafa' al-itidab. Then when he goes into sujud, it will be the first sajda, and then the second sajda. And then he comes back up again to do the second rak'ah. So basically, the first rak'ah he did initially, it's what? It's not it's not void. It is not counted. You now continue from this ruku' and you treat this ruku as your first ruku and that initial ruku which you missed out it's recovered here so then you now essentially pray uh you, you essentially treat this as a first rak'ah and you then continue with your salah from there and then at the end of the prayer you come with yourself to cover up for the mistake that you that you made clear inshallah Ta'ib. so that's another case that falls under the third case the fourth case that requires from a person that leads a person to perform the sujood sahab is leaving off one of the abav Remember we said the salah divides into arkan, ab'av, hi'at. Leaving off one of the ab'av leads a person to prostrate due to forgetfulness. However, understand that if someone left out one of the ab'av and then he went into a pillar. So method, let's say somebody forgot the tashahud and he jumped up to the third rak'ah from the second sujood of the second rak'ah. Then he is not allowed to return to do the tashahud. If he was to return on purpose, then the salah will become invalid. Likewise, if someone whilst getting up, whilst getting up, so that, that the initial case was one who got up completely, i.e. he entered into that third rak'ah, you can't go back now, because you're already in a ruk, you're already in a pillar, you can't leave a pillar to go do a, something which is less than a pillar, which is a sunnah, muakkada. you can't do that, طيب. however, let's say somebody who's in the process of getting up, and he remembered, whilst in that, so he's not completely up yet, but he's in the process of getting up, and he remembered, and then he went back, then we have to look at, what state was he in when he was getting up? If he got up and he was at the level of above the ruku', so you know when the person does the ruku', he's in a position. If he went above that in his coming up, طيب, so he's not yet fully up, but he's above the position where a person will be doing ruku', then and he came back, then he should come with sujood sahu. But if he was in a position lower than the level of the ruku', and he went back, then there is no sujood sahu required from him. طيب, so that's an important point to understand. Then we have a point which falls under the fourth point and the author Rahim Allah mentioned, which is That if someone forgot a hi'a and he went back to it from a rukun, for example, let's say somebody he forgot to aul istiftah and he said Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahim is part of Fatiha, so it's a rukun. And then he remembered that he missed out on the dua istiftah and so he went back and he did dua istiftah. This doesn't nullify the prayer. This going back, even if it was done on purpose, doesn't nullify the prayer. Unlike someone who went into a complete rukun like a third rak'ah and he went back on purpose to do a tashahud right this nullifies the prayer but the one who leaves of a rukun to go back to a hi'ah it doesn't nullify the salah but of course there is less reward in that in that salah طيب. that's an important point for a person to understand as well likewise if a person was to perform a hi'ah which is of course the sunnah which we spoke about in the previous lesson طيب. outside of where it should be for example he did dua al during the uh, tashahud مثلا. or he did dua during the during the sujood He's meant to do it in, the, in, in its place, right? Which is Ba'da uh, Takbir. But he didn't do it. He did it somewhere else. Then this, of course, it doesn't nullify the prayer. It doesn't nullify the prayer. However, it is not rewarded. That act which you have done, it is not rewarded. You don't get anything for it. For example, somebody who recites a surah before Fatiha. He says, Allah Akbar. And then he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna a'atayna fa al-kawthar. And then he recites with Fatiha. And then he says, Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. That, that, that surah you recited is not rewarded. But it doesn't nullify the prayer. It does not nullify the salah. A very very important point for a person to understand Yes, sujood zahaw is a sunnah And its place is qabla salam However, if a person does sujood zahaw For a reason that does not require sujood zahaw Then the salah becomes invalid Why? Because you are adding something to the prayer On purpose which is not part of it Right? This sujood zahaw is there for a reason It's only there for a reason You can only do it for a reason If that reason is not there 
then you're adding to the prayer that which is not from it and so that nullifies your, your salah right? and so you have to be very very sure that what you have done is something which requires sujood al so that you can do sujood al without having your salah being invalid but if you didn't have a reason for example it's somebody he forgot the hayah he forgot du'a al sitah and he did sujood al because of that then this sujood is not a reason it's not valid why? The salah, the, the entire salah becomes becomes nullified because this sujood al the reason for it is not leaving off a hayah there are four reasons we mentioned it and one of them is not leaving off a hayah right? and so if you leave off a hayah and you do sujood al then your salah becomes invalid why? because you've added to the prayer that which is not from it right? Wallahu ta'ala alam then the author rahimahullah ta'ala moves on to speak about uh, uh, an issue pertaining to awqat al-karaha the times in which praying a salah is disliked and of course when we say karaha here it is one of the rare cases in which the karaha is mahmur ala tahrim in which the karaha is deemed to be haram the, kar- the karaha is karaha tahrimiya not karaha tanzihiya the asl when it comes to the karaha is that it is what ma yuthabu ala tarqihi of course biniyatin wa yuthabu ala wa la yuaqabu ala fi'lihi yuthabu ala tarqihi biniyatin wa la yuaqabu ala fi'lihi that's the asl when it comes to the karaha but in this case the karaha is mahmur ala tahrim it is carried to me what? that it's impermissible meaning if a person did it on purpose he prayed a salah that has no reason i.e. attached to it or no reason preceding it if there is no reason preceding it and you pray a salah method, let's say just two uh, rak'at because you wanted to pray during these times of prohibition and you knew the timing and you knew the hukum then this is sinful this is sinful right? and so the author he says فصل وخمسة أوقات لا يصلى فيها إلا صلاة لها سبب بعد الصلاة الصبح تطلع الشمس وعند طلوعها حتى تتكامل وترتفع قد رمح وإذا استوت حتى تزول وبعد صلاة العصر حتى تغرب الشمس وعند الغروب حتى يتكامل غروبها so these five times a person is not allowed to perform a salah that has no reason preceding it and of course the only exception that is given is if a person is in the haram in Makki if the person is in the haram if he's in the haram then it doesn't matter whatever time it may be he is allowed to pray any salah whether it has a reason or it has no reason and it doesn't matter whatever time it may it may be طيب. if you're not in the haram however then these are five times in which you're not allowed to perform a salah that has no reason preceding it and when I say salah that has no reason preceding it then we mean by it مثلا تحيات المسجد when you enter into the masjid, you have to pray to rak'at. The Messenger of Allah, he said that if a person enters into the masjid, then he should not sit down until he prays to rak'at. And so the reason here precedes the salah. And it's of course the fact that you've entered into the masjid. طيب. And so you pray to rak'at and it doesn't matter whatever time you pray that salah. طيب. So if you enter into the masjid after praying fajr, طيب, and uh, it's still during a time in which uh, the sun hasn't risen yet, then you can pray the two rak'at. Why? Because this salah is salah laha sabab. But if a salah doesn't have a sabab, if it has no reason, or if the reason comes after the prayer, then you're not allowed to pray these prayers during these five times in which salah is prohibited. For example, rak'at al-ihram, salat al-istikhara, and likewise a mutlaq al-nafl. Mutlaq al-nafl. So what are these five times? Number one, after fajr prayer. So as soon as a person prays fajr, then he's not allowed to pray a salah up until the sun rises. So until the sun begins to rise, طيب, you're not allowed to pray. A salah. So if you prayed fajr, khalas. you can't pray a salah that has no reason. So you can't just stand up after fajr and pray two rak'at. You can't pray salat al-istikhara after salat al-subh until the sun rises. That's the first time. The second time is وَعِنْدَ طُلُوعِهَا حَتَّى تَتَكَامَلَ وَتَرْتَفِعَ قَادَ الرُّحِ Likewise, when the sun begins to rise, then you have to wait until the sun completely rises and it rises up to the height of a spear. It rises up to the height of a, of a spear. So there's a time period in which you're not allowed to pray any salat that does not have a reason attached to it طيب, or a reason preceding it طيب. and of course يعني, this stems from a hadith nabawiya the third timing وَإِذَا اسْتَوَتْ حَتَّى تَزُولْ وَإِذَا اسْتَوَتْ حَتَّى تَزُولْ like when the sun reaches the peak i.e. the highest point in the sky up until it descends when the sun reaches the highest point in the sky until it descends, until it descends from that highest point in the sky that's a time period in which you're not allowed to pray a salat that has no reason preceding it. Likewise, وَبَعْدَ صَلَاةِ الْعَصْرِ حَتَّى تَغْرُبَ الشَّمْسِ Likewise, when a person prays Asr, up until the sun sets, that period, you're not allowed to pray a salat that has no reason attached to it or preceding it. طيب. وَعِنْدَ الْغُرُوبِ حَتَّى يَتَكَامَلَ غُرُوبُهَا Likewise, when the sun begins to set, up until it completely sets, then also you're not allowed to pray a salat 
during this time of course الصلاة لها سبب متقدم طيب الصلاة لها سبب متأخر right as I mentioned you can pray a salat that has a reason which is what متقدم لا تحيط المسجد أو مثلا ركعتها للفجر أو a a a مثلا ركعتها للوضوء مثلا ركعتها التطهر right that's permissible for a person to pray at any time طيب because it's a salat that has a reason طيب but if the salat does not have a reason preceding it then these are five times in which you have to avoid praying those types of salawat wallahu a'lam then the author rahimahullah ta'ala moves on to discuss mabahith and masail pertaining to salat al-jama'ah pertaining to congregational prayer and so he says fasl wa salat al-jama'ah ti sunnat al-mu'akkadah wa ala al-ma'mumi an yanwi al-itimama dun al-imam wa yajuzu an yatam al-hurru bil-abd والبالغ بالمراهق ولا تصح قدوة رجل بمرأة ولا قارئ بأمي وأي موضع صلى في المسجد بصلاة الإمام فيه وهو عالم بصلاته فيه أجزأه ما لم يتقدم عليه وإن صلى في المسجد والمأموم قريب منه وهو عالم بصلاته ولا حائل هناك جاز طيب سيد يوثر رحمه الله he speaks about the مسائل بتين انتو صلاة الجماعة and he said that it is a سنة مؤكدة وهذا هو المعتمد this is the Mu'tamad. Even there is a khilaf within the madhab as to whether it's a sunnah mu'akkada or fard kifaya. And so this means that the person should not be lax when it comes to the congregational prayer. He mentions that the ma'mum, the one who is uh, following the imam, he has to come with the intention of praying behind the imam in order to get the reward of the jama'ah with the imam. So he must intend being a ma'mum, being a follower of this imam. That's a must. Whereas for the Imam, it is only a Sunnah. The Imam, it is recommended for him to intend that he is an Imam. But if he doesn't do it, then it doesn't affect his prayer. But the Ma'mum, he has to intend. He has to intend of being a Ma'mum. If he doesn't intend being a Ma'mum and being a follower of this Imam, then his Salah is invalid because he's following an Imam who is not his Imam. He has not intended this Imam to be his Imam. So for example, somebody who's praying and in his heart, he doesn't want to pray behind this Imam. Matter you find some people who, uh, يعني, who view an imam to be a disbeliever. However, they're forced to pray behind the imam. Right? However, they view the imam to be a disbeliever. And so they're praying behind the imam. Vahira, from the apparent. But in their heart, they're, in, they're not praying with the imam. This person's salah is invalid. Which is why when the imam salah finishes, they go back and they repeat their, their prayer. Right? And so this person, he's ma'mum. He's in a ma'mum. When you're a ma'mum, you have to intend to pray behind the imam. If you do not intend to pray behind the imam, that you're following this imam, then your salah is invalid. And as we know, the place, the place of the niyyah is the heart. What the left will and the be sunnah. And to utter it according to the madhab is a sunnah. And so you should come with it. Of course, when you're uttering it, you have to utter it before you actually enter into the prayer. Because if you utter it during the prayer, then your salah becomes invalid because you came with kalam al amd, which is not from the prayer. So you have to utter before the salah. However, if you do it in the heart, then the intention of the heart can come before the takbir, during the takbir, and after the takbir. In the heart, but tarafuf you have to do it before the takbir. Taib. Likewise, the ma'mum he must know the movements of the, of the imam. The ma'mum he must know the movements of the imam, and this could be either by hearing or by seeing. And of course, there must not be, as he said, wala ha'ila hunak. So, مثلا, let's say somebody is outside of the masjid, however, he's close to him, and the ulama mentioned 300 arms length or 300 yards. That's the maximum limit. So, if you're Within that, then you're still allowed to pray behind this imam. However, you have to have knowledge of his salah, of his movements, either through hearing or through seeing. And there is no ha'il, there is no blockage, pure, complete block between you and the imam. However, if there is an open door between you and the imam, you're outside the masjid, but you're still within 300 yards and there is an open door and you're able to hear the imam. And the imam is also aware, method, let's say, during Jum'ah prayer when the masjid becomes completely full and there are people outside of the masjid, طيب, then these people outside of the masjid, the imam knows that, he's out, that, he, that they are outside the masjid because of the fact that the masjid is full. He knows that. And he also, uh, and the people also are able to hear the prayer of the imam or they're able to see someone who's praying behind. Or there is someone from among them is able to see someone who's praying with the imam. طيب, then you are allowed to uh, follow this imam. طيب, if you're within the 300 yards or within, uh, you're close to the imam, of course, Urfan, uh, and as I mentioned, the general juice is around 300 or so uh, yards. Uh, um, or 300, nah, 300 or so arms length as they say طيب, uh, 
and of course there is no complete block there is no complete ha'il between you and the and the imam or method you're inside a masjid so if you're inside a masjid anywhere in the masjid then it's okay if you're inside a masjid as long as you're able to know the movements of the of the imam and number two ma lam tataqaddam alayhi you must not be in front of the imam if you are in front of the imam then your salah becomes invalid the imam must always be in front of the the ma'mum and of course you must follow the imam inna ma du'a al imam wa yu'tamma yu'tamma bi طيب so for example if you have a masjid that has like four floors like some masjid in our country they have four floors طيب uh, the imam is in the lower floor and everyone else is the people are what? either on the same floor as him or levels above him but it's in the same masjid then of course they share one staircase and so there is a connection between the imam and the imam right uh, and so we can say that this salah is valid of those who are on the upper floors there is no problem in that that's the last mabhath that the author rahimahullah ta'ala discussed and one more point which we skipped which is the imam and the ma'mum who can lead who so a slave can lead a free man and a free man can also lead a slave likewise a baligh can lead a murahiq a murahiq is someone who is close to puberty but he hasn't yet reached puberty for example yani he's maybe someone like 10 or 11 and he hasn't yet he hasn't had the signs of puberty yet upon him طيب, he's yet to reach puberty i.e he's yet to reach the final sign of puberty which is of course complete in 15 years and he hasn't got any of the signs yet but he's reached the age of what 10 11 he's above tamiz right but he's not yet badir. he's allowed to lead the prayer likewise uh, uh, a, a a slave is allowed to lead a free man and a free man is allowed to lead a slave but it's not allowed for a woman to lead a man a woman cannot lead a a man but a man can lead a woman right and likewise a qari cannot be led by an ummi and when we say ummi we mean by it someone who's not able to read the fatiha someone who has mistakes in the fatiha is an ummi even if he may have phds and doctorates it doesn't matter he's still a illiterate person because he's unable to perfect the fatiha and so someone who method and let's say he has a speech impediment and so he's unable to pronounce the letters properly he has a problem with the lam or the ra or the seen or the saad or the sa'i and so he's unable to pronounce his letters he shouldn't be leading the prayer even if he may be one of the greatest ulama of our time he shouldn't be leading the prayer why because he's unable to pronounce these these letters طيب, in, in the way that it should be pronounced and not have a sound fatiha and so this ummi cannot be leading a qari rather the qari must lead the ummi and also the fasiq can lead the can lead the uh, thaqi that's permissible in the whole minute we know that from the aqil al sunnah is that we pray behind kullu barri wa fasiq we pray behind any barq any good one and also any fajr as well طيب, as long as he's not a disbeliever طيب هذا والله اعلم we've come to the end of this lesson subhanak allahum wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh